First, let me say what a pleasure it is to be here with a group of friends whose writings and critical interventions have inspired me for years and with whom I've had the pleasure of collaborating. It seems really not accidental that Stathis Gagouris, John Hamilton, Tom Keenan, as well as Jacques Lesser and Jane Tylus have work which is coming out or has come out at roughly the same time because it's germinated in a common scene. We, I would call it New York uptown and downtown, but of course it extends to the many places we live and work. And you know, to make a grandiose claim, I think actually in many cases, ways our collective projects have shifted the contents of Complet. What our books collectively highlight are topics that have political traction in the real world, while also extending certain technical formations in the humanities, deconstruction, philology, poesis, exegesis, translation practices, media theory, and especially philosophy. These topics on which we all write include, and I think these are some of the where places we overlap, the politics of secularization, the application of philology to modes of existence, secular criticism as non-transcendental metaphysics, and war as that which needs no translation. This is an idea Tom has worked on, indeed, which represents the limit case where translation is impossible, um, or to extend this also towards his project, uh, another problem, the impossibility of visualizing democracy, which is separate from imagining or writing it. So now a few words about my own book. As some of you know, it, it grew out of an ambitious project that I worked on with Barbara Cassin, Etienne Balibar, Jacques Lesra, and Michael Wood, which involved editing the English edition and translation of Barbara Cassin's Vocabulaire Européen des Philosophies, Dictionnaire des Intraduisibles, um, which is going to come out with Princeton in 2014, in February, hopefully celebrated here as well, under the controversially translated title, Dictionary of Untranslatables of Philosophical Lexicon. And I won't uh, go into that choice, but it's something hopefully we'll have a chance to talk more about in other occasions. And of course, the vocabulaire was an impossible project. How do you translate the untranslatable, and especially into a sort of a hegemonic language like English. And this in turn um, was involved taking very seriously Cassin's, one of her working premises, which is that she wants to philosophize in languages. Philosophize in languages which means that this project is not an encyclopedia of static concepts. It's not a concept history as in Koselec and others. It is a question of what happens when w philosophical problematics are viewed through the lens of how they don't translate across languages or why they're continuously retranslated or why they are in a sense preserved as terms within as almost loan words in other languages. So that's, those are some of the very uh, basic ways one can define this term and it's at the key of course uh, at the heart of what I'm calling untranslatability. But of course I'm also drawing on uh, terms that and work by Samuel Weber on the abilities of ability, in a sense. He talks about Benjamin's uh, translate ability, the ability within that, and I'm pushing this more in terms of um, the opposite effects. So the untranslatable in Cassin's project was used to project a, a cartography of national differences in the field of language. It treated the concept word, as I mentioned, not as an abstracted entry within concept history, but as a politically situated locution. And it was polemically marshaled to stage, uh, especially in the French context, a, a difficult confrontation between continental and analytic philosophy, between philosophy that engages in a critique of metaphysics, the logos, sovereign truths, and philosophy that presupposes a language of the world centered on the referential value of truth claims. That's a real simplification, but I just throw that out. Now, of course, it's kind of counterintuitive to argue for untranslatability in the era of what some have called the translational turn. And there are critics who consider such a move to be unconvincing, if, down, if not downright folly. 
I'm thinking of David Bellows' book, Is That a Fish in Your Ear? Translation and the Meaning of Everything, which because he has an agent is selling a ton. And, um, (laughs) 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 but he writes that the circulation of novels among all the vehicular languages of the world and their incontestable conversations with one another demonstrate without a shadow of doubt that style does survive translation. In some, the widespread notion that style is untranslatable, he says, is just a variant of the folkish nostrum that a translation is no substitute for the original. And he treats the idea that certain contents are ineffable or ungraspable to similar skepticism, arguing with clever reverse logic that the ineffable quote is not a problem for translation, but translation is one big problem for the ineffable. So for Bellows, he says, one of the truths that translation teaches us is that everything is effable. Everything is effable. Now in my view, to say that everything is effable implies faith in the limitless capacities of human rationalist epistemology. It's more of a categorical statement about the conditions of optimal cognizability than a proof of linguistic ineffability or untranslatability. Bellows suggests that translators breach the limit of expression simply by doing what they do, which is to say translating. Yes, I would reply, translators make headway against the ineffability with ingenious discoveries of words for saying the unsaid with felicitous feats of synonymy but this doesn't make translatability the operative rule or disqualify untranslatability. So part of what I'm doing here is activating the untranslatable, not as pure difference, which is rightly suspect as just another non-coeval form of the romantic absolute or fetish of the other, but as a linguistic form of creative failure with homeopathic use. So also in my book, Untranslatability becomes a way of working. I explore how it harks back to theories of translation. The bans, and this is where it coincides, I think, with Stathis' work, the bans and prohibitions on translating sacred texts. Translation is a term used to, to refer to God's inscription on the world, humans, and objects. The idea of being translated in a religious sense, which is very often taken to mean to die, to be transported, uh, or to be in a state of transfinitude. Or theologies of translational justice, which echoes in the French expression, traduire en justice, which means literally to prosecute. The book's original title, I recall, was The Politics of Untranslatability in Comparative Literature, which seeded the whole project in a meditation on the discipline. But I soon realized that comparative literature for me really wasn't the center of gravity. Or if it was, it was because it was a problem of translating itself. It's it's in a sense a term generating machine that seeks to name or relate comparative non-national entities or units. And it's an idea, and if it's an idea that congeals around some notion, some utopian idea of a planetary paradigm with an eco-political purview, it's continually facing the problem of repeating the unipolar logic of global capital. Lots of terms try to get around the ontological nationalism of names for languages and countries and regions and ethnic groups, diaspora, transnational, Circumatlantic, South by South, Ile Refuge, Paris states, the list is endless. But as they proliferate, they call up phantom identities that themselves soon become ossified. And so in a sense, comparative literature for me is that in continued criticality, that uh, sense of always new terms, but also a a suspicion that those terms very quickly uh, become hardened into something that then has to be to keep on translating. So it's a kind of translation terminable, interminable. Um, Do I have a few more minutes? You have 20 seconds. (laughs) Okay, all right, well. Slow. um, 
then you'll just have to get the book for what I was going to say. But as it, as it went to press, Verso's marketing department sent me a questionnaire containing queries that I found very difficult to answer. What needs will the book be fulfilling? <laughs> what will it help its readers to do better? If the book could be said to fulfill a need or help readers do anything better, I would point to its potential contribution to forms of literary comparatism that recognize the importance of non-translation, mistranslation, incomparability, and untranslatability. And I will stop there. Mm -hmm.